Got it. Okay, so today we're going to look at the word sent, as in God sent different things, such as dis, uh, destruction, disasters, and death. Uh, there's lots of verses that talk about him doing things like that. Question is, did he really do those things? Okay, and I've got a cover here of a book, uh, The Lord Sent It, uh, which is all about that word sent and different things God is said to have sent. I don't have that book. I have an, I have an e-book of it. But I do have um, two other books also by Troy Edwards, a friend in Rhode Island. And uh, <clears throat> he's written a lot of books on <clears throat> various character of God topics. And he's dealt quite a bit with that one. So if anyone wants to delve more into that after what we do today, I can put you in touch with his, his books there. So if you take the Bible literally, just as it reads in English, it certainly looks like God was responsible for a lot of troubles, a lot of things that came on Israel over the years. Um, <clears throat> and here's some examples. So let me put up, sorry, the um, list of verses here too. <clears throat> okay, so... Let's have Axel to start. Axel, if you could read Exodus 9.23, please. <clears throat> and Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along, and the fire ran along upon the ground and the lord rained hail upon the land of egypt <clears throat> okay you'll notice in each of these verses um after the word sent i've put the hebrew word and it's either going to be uh, nathan or shellac two different words are commonly translated as sent so dorothy do you have the next one numbers 21 6 yeah and the lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they they bit the people and much people of the of yeah. israel died okay oh. um nora i'll just mention your verse now so you can find it um your verse will be first chronicles, yeah first chronicles 21 14 yeah first chronicles yeah. 21 14 uh -huh. Okay, Fabian, can you go ahead with the next one? Yeah. So Samuel called unto the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Okay, and the next one uh, would be Gary, uh, 2 Samuel 24, 15. Okay. <clears throat> so the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. Okay, so it was under pestilence. And 2 Kings 17, 25, Megan, you have that. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they fear not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slay some of them. Okay, and 2 Kings 24, 2, that's Michael. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldeas, and bands of the Syrians, and bands of the Moabites, and <clears throat> bands of the children of Adam, and sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. Okay, and uh, Nora, are you ready with uh, First Chronicles twenty-one fourteen? Uh, yeah, just. <laughs> so the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel's servants a thousand men, thousand men. Hmm. Okay, 70,000. 70, yeah. And uh, Paul, Second Chronicles 32, 21. 
<clears throat> Lord sent an angel who cut down every mighty man of valor, leader and captain in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned shame faced to his own land. And when he had gone into the temple of his God, some of his own offspring struck him down with a sword there. Oh. Okay, and I'll, I'll read this uh, first one. Well, no, let's have Axel do that. So keep on running. Well, Axel's not there. <clears throat> Axel, uh, John 1, 4. This is the one verse I put in from the New Testament. Most of you will be looking at Old Testament here. Axel, do you have John 1, 4? Yes, I do. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay, I must have the verse wrong. Um, I'll read it here from the screen. Yeah, it wouldn't be John 1, 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Maybe it's John 11 or 21 or something. I'll have to correct that. <clears throat> so you can see... Um, the Lord sent thunder and hail, fiery serpents, um, pestilence, uh, lions, uh, the Chaldeans, Chaldees and other enemies, more pestilence. Um, he sent an angel to cut off his soldiers and sent a great wind. Um, so many people would say, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it for me. <clears throat> what is wrong? with that kind of thinking. Sounds real good on the surface. The Bible says that I believe it. What's wrong with that thinking? Michael. Well, you mentioned the word surface. Um, is that what the Bible really means though? And I think the only way we can uh, determine that is to dig. <laughs> So just don't take things on, on face value. Dig to the point where you can get a principle. Okay, so we need to dig for the principle. Okay, others? Uh, Paul? <clears throat> Well, it, um, if you know history, you know that man has corrupted everything. And there's so much of the Bible that has been corrupted. And we know that God knew that was going to happen because he put warnings in his word against doing that. And so, you know, it, it's dangerous to accept anything at face value. <clears throat> okay, so you're saying the word itself is corrupted. Things have been added and taken away. Um, there definitely has been some of that. Um, you know, to a large degree, God has preserved his word or preserved the meaning. And what I think is that in spite of the corruptions and changes in word meanings, and you're right, there's lots of things like that. When we look carefully, we can decipher and find the true meaning. So it does, it takes the digging. Yes. Okay, others, other, other ways in which that is wrong? Well, I think Jesus himself, uh, especially in his conversation with Nicodemus uh, when he when he quoted when he spoke as God uh, Nicodemus took it as he heard it as kind of literal having to be born again enter the the womb of your mother and Jesus said no uh, when I speak in this particular case, you're not to understand it literally. And then he explained that it had a deeper, uh, more spiritual reality to it than what you just see at face value. 
So he gives us an example there that we're not to understand his word all the time, literally, in every case. Okay, good. Okay. Any others? This is important. We need to understand that while it is God's word and it's true, we do need to dig below the surface. Uh, there's other reasons I think we can come up with. It's a, it's a lazy way of hearing. Yeah. Yeah, many people say, the Bible says that I believe it. You know, they make themselves sound real certain, mm. real confident in the word, and yet they're, they're being lazy. Um, Fabian, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I think it's, it's how the authors view God at the time, or at that time. So it's according to how they view God, that's how they, they wrote. Or that okay. was the, you know, because even when we look at Job, we see the, the, the his friends, how, how they, um, you know, whatever was happening to him, they attributed it at, like to God. That was their thinking at the time. So. <clears throat> okay, good. Yeah, that does come into it. Uh, Axel, did you have your hand up? Uh, I... I, I was thinking, you know, many times, you know, when we we read the Bible, like, like for instance, when I speak to people, the, their understanding of the Bible, they they measure God according to how they they um according to our human our human methods, our human understanding of of of, of character. That, that's the best way I could put it. We tend to. We tend to view God according to how we view ourselves or, or each other. That's that's as high as uh, of the standard that we reach in our interpretation of God. Okay, good. And that certainly leads to problems. We like to have a God in our own image. I've heard it stated that way. That that is perfectly what, yeah. what I yeah. wanted to say. Another reason to reject or be suspicious of those statements. Um, it makes God into, uh, I'm going to say, makes him into a monster that he monster. kills people. And, you know, yeah. there's, there's much worse things than even the verses I have there um, that he has said to do if you just read it on the surface. <clears throat> um, it causes many contradictions. Yes. That's a good one. Um, doesn't the Bible tell us that God is love? Can a God of love really mm -hmm. destroy people like that? Um, yeah, yeah, lots of problems. Um, Not my God. No. Most of you are probably familiar with M Miller's rules for Bible study, for Bible interpretation. They're very important, I think. And uh, one of them says you need to consider basically the text of the whole Bible. Um, when a person reads, um, the Lord sent a great wind, you know, it sounds like he was personally responsible for that in many aspects of, in many examples of destruction. But when you consider the larger context, the context of the whole Bible, uh, you get a different picture. picture. Hey, any others? There's quite a few reasons um, to reject what those verses say on the surface. Um, Fabian, did you have a hand up again? Yes. Is is well? Is it a um, possibility they um, may tend to to look at man instead of God? Because when you look at when you read the Old Testament, well, when you read the New Testament, um, the, the Jews would say, oh, Moses gave us a law to, um, you know, stone the adulteress or whatever. It's so, like they would look at man, man's action. It's like they would, it's like they would put Moses above God, basically. I mean... That's how I see it. Yeah. 
True. Yeah. Yes, sometimes. Yeah, they would look at Moses. They would go to Moses instead of thinking, wait, let me look at God and view God as he is. <clears throat> okay. They look at, they look at the, old, the prophets. Yeah. So can... Yeah, Paul, were you going to add to that? I was just going to say, they told God, you don't talk to us. Uh, let Moses talk to us. Right. right. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think how to put that down. But, um, it's as if Moses, um, if you don't mind, um, yeah. I interject. It's as if Moses, more, like, like what Moses did was more supreme. Like his, his word was more supreme than, than God. <laughs> Um, Axel? I think there's an element of fear um, in that if, if people, people become resistant to, to, to studying and learning the truth because there is a fear that, okay, if I know more, it means that I would have to change, I would have to disrupt my, my, my level of comfort here. So mm -hmm. I would rather go with the knowledge that I have, the little knowledge that I have, or no knowledge at all than to make that change. It's it's fear of change. People don't want to take responsibility. Yeah. Yes, yes. <clears throat> okay, so there's quite a few reasons uh, right. we've listed here. It's good to think about that. I think so, Gary and Paul had their hands up. Okay, okay. Uh, Gary? Well, we know that the uh, spirit authored, influenced the writing of the Bible. And the Bible does say that no man knows the things of the spirit except the spirit. So we have to have the spirit to enlighten us as to the meaning of what is being said there. Because no man knows God, save God. Therefore, if God does not help us with those written words which he inspired we will interpret them based upon uh, a knowledge of ourselves and project ourselves on the bible get an incorrect meaning mm -hmm. so we need the spirit to help us to interpret what the spirit has inspired and we surely will make a mistake okay. sounds um, a bit like the mirror principle yeah um i paul I was just going to say that, um, you know, the original languages <clears throat> that it was written in, in the translation to our language, a lot has been lost, especially the thought, Hebrew thought, Greek thought is people thought and think differently than we do. And so the word meanings, the idioms, all those things that you need to understand to to get the foundation of a lot of these, uh, like even the parables. <clears throat> so that, that without studying, you don't get a lot of that. Okay, good. Uh, that's a good one. I should have had that earlier. Um, that's why we're doing this whole uh, glossary, looking at different words that have an impact on the character of God and the gospel itself. Good. Was there any other comments? No, okay. Um, you know, so on the surface, a lot of these things read like acts of God, and yet when, when you read the little book, Acts of Our Gentle God, right away you see a contradiction just in the title. Um, acts of God is a term commonly used um, by insurance uh, industry and news media and whatever to attribute disasters and things to God. Well, our gentle God does not do such things. So the correct meaning of the word sent becomes very important. Let's look at the original word meanings a bit. <clears throat> um, so one word that's commonly translated as sent is Nathan. Um, it's translated in all these different ways. And I've kind of highlighted uh, give is the most common translation. Uh, deliver is quite often used uh, to deliver up. Um, send is used not very many times, really, 11. 
you'll see there's 167 miscellaneous words. So those are cases where Nathan is translated to one particular word, maybe in English. There's actually, I counted them up, there's 116 different entries in Young's Concordance for words into which Nathan is translated. So the King James authors and other Bible um, translators rather, are come to this original word, how should we translate it? Wow, they came up with 116 different words. It just shows how variable the meaning, how variable is the meaning of, of Hebrew words. Um, it's just interesting, and if you look in a baby boy names book, people use those when they're about to have a child, a Nathan means God gives. God gives. God gives. So we're mostly concerned here with cases of God sending disasters, etc., on Israel. I mean, and the other word shalak here are both uh, Hebrew words used in the Old Testament, obviously. <clears throat> Here's one quite interesting verse. Um, Dorothy, if you could, no, 12, 1. Yeah, Dorothy, if you could read that. First, Second Samuel 12, 1. And the Lord sent unto David, they sent Nathan unto David, and he, he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. I don't okay. get what, what, what you're talking about. So, so this is when Nathan came to David and confronted him with his sin concerning Bathsheba and uh, the murder of Uriah the Hittite. And it's just interesting that while the scent here uses this other word, shellac, shellac and Nathan are practically interchangeable. They're used in the same way. So it could almost, That's if the other word had been used, it could say, and the Lord sent Nathan, Nathan. See, Nathan, actually, Nathan, the name Nathan actually means sent or given. So it's just kind of interesting that those two words, um, or the Nathan was used in that way by God. So the other word is <coughs> shalak, and it's used in these ways, uh, send 566 times, and the total of 847 uses uh, with 22 miscellaneous. So there's quite a few different words again into which shalak is translated, just showing how variable the possibilities are for translation. Um, so they're both, essentially they're both used for to send an effect to a person or people, an effect being disaster, death or whatever. And it's also used to send a person to a place or on a mission or something like that. So both sending something to a person and a person to go and do something. A good example of the second case is where Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Okay, he's using that, this word shellac. <clears throat> so let's look at some of the individual verses that use these words. Um, 2 Samuel 24, 15. Uh, Fabian, please. <clears throat> so the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan, even to Bathsheba, 7,000 men. Okay. So the word for sent is Nathan, which means to give, give up, deliver. So where it says the Lord sent a pestilence, it could be that he gave, well, um, yeah, I wrote it down here, possible way it could be translated. So the Lord gave up Israel to the pestilence. In other words, he ceased to protect them from the pestilence is a way to understand it. Okay, another one here is Leviticus 26, 25. That's scary, please. Okay, and I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of the covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you. Okay, um, Nora, Nora, I'll just mention your next verse so you can look it up, is uh, Deuteronomy yeah. 8, 15. Deuteronomy yeah. 8, 15, okay? 
Yeah. So in what yeah. Gary just read there, uh, Nathanus translated uh, delivered, um, and then send is translated as shellac. So we've got an example of both of those words in this one verse. It's interesting that the word and is supplied. I've highlighted it there in yellow. So the verse could easily read, if we were to leave out, leave out the and, which is not in the original, it could read something like, I will send, using shellac, the pestilence among you, ye shall be delivered, using the than, into the hand of the enemy. So very often um, in Hebrew literature, a verse can have two parts that are kind of equated with each other, the one explaining the other. So essentially it's saying to send the pestilence equals or is equivalent to delivering to the enemy. In this case, the enemy is the form of pestilence that's referred to. Uh, Paul? Can I read a little something from Adam Clark's commentary? Sure. Is it on that verse? No, it's just uh, something about the Hebrew verbs. Okay. Go ahead. It says that the same Hebrew verb can be declaratory, which is a statement of fact, pre privative, privative, a which is a request, imperative, a command. The future tense is used to express all these senses. So the Hebrew language is uh, complex and expressive. It is. And when you try to look at the Hebrew, uh, the written Hebrew is confusing too because they have prefixes and suffixes galore that change the, the tense of the root word or something about the word. So it can make it quite difficult. I'm sure when you know it, they say that English is a very hard language to learn if you don't know it. So uh, one more thing. Yep, Paul. Uh, we didn't say anything about punctuation, but they didn't have punctuation. So all the punctuation has been added and that can change yeah. A sentence quite a bit. Right. Yeah, the translators had to decide the translation of each word or phrase and where to put the punctuation. <clears throat> and later on, um, verses, the, the Bible was broken up into chapters and verses, and there was even mistakes made there. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> where one thought extends over from one verse to another or even one chapter to another. I've seen cases of that. So in that verse, Leviticus 26, 25, the meaning is that when the pestilence comes, it is because they have been handed over or delivered to the enemy. It's not God that's doing it himself, okay? Let's, um, let's take a break now for a few minutes, okay? And we will come back and continue with uh, Psalm 81 there. So we'll come back in 10 minutes. And, um, okay. See ya. Okay, so let's continue at Psalm 81, 11 to 14. That's uh, Megan. Megan, if you could read that, please. Sure. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them on give them up unto their own hearts, lusts, and they walk in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. Okay, so that verse is using the word shalak. Um, and it's translated into gave them up, okay? So it's clearly permissive in that verse, in that passage, and it's quite clear. God is basically saying, okay, have it your way. Um, you know, I, I could have dealt with your enemies. I could have taken care of things for you, but you insist on doing it your way. So I'm going to let you do that. Uh, God is big on free will, very big on free will. Okay, uh, the next verse is Numbers 21, 6. 
And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Okay. Um, the I question there is, is and that's, that's one you commonly hear, actually. I've heard that even on the radio a few times in different contexts, uh, God sending fiery serpents. And it's an example of you know, how God treats his people and deals with problems. But did God actually send the serpents? Um, Nora, no. Nora, do you have uh, Deuteronomy 8.15? Yeah. Um, 8.15. Who led thee through that great and terrible <clears throat> wilderness? Um, wherein were fiery servants and scorpions and drought where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, of flint. Okay. yeah good um axel i see you had your hand up rock of flint. yeah uh, just a slight observation the next verse um i think yeah. you have the you might want to change it because it's it doesn't coincide with the it's 21.5. 21.5, okay. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> um, okay, so... And the serpents the, were already there. The serpents were already there. Good. And the drought was already there, too. This is an area with little rainfall. And God dealt with both problems. He provided water, and he protected them from the fiery serpents. Um, God is always, you know, there's verses to talk about him being our protector in different ways. But when they reject him and they want to go their own way to do their own thing, God basically backs off and I'm not going to impose my presence or protection or anything on you. Uh, if you want to do it that way, okay. Uh, but it's going to hurt if you get bit by these things. Um <clears throat> Okay, Numbers 21.5, that's Paul. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? <clears throat> For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Okay. Oh, my. So that's Numbers 21.5 coming just before 21.6, where it says the Lord sent fiery serpents. Verse 5 is giving the reason why he sent them. Okay, they spake against God and against Moses. Um, <clears throat> it's a rejection of God and of even Moses, his appointed uh, leader of them. Right. <clears throat> um, next verse is Isaiah 34 2. Uh, that would be Axel again. Yeah. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all the armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the <clears throat> slaughter. Okay. So they are destroyed by being delivered to the slaughter by their enemies. Mm. Okay. It's not that God himself is destroying them. And when you read also... Um, his fury upon their armies, uh, fury, anger, wrath, all those terms are similar, and they all need to be understood in the correct way. And we've done other studies on that. I won't go into that, but if, if you are struggling with the, ter the idea of God's wrath, um, you can find that. It's on my website in the glossary and in other places, I'm sure. Um, God's wrath is basically him leaving um, leaving the situation, leaving people to the consequences of their own decisions, that kind of thing. Okay, so let's go to uh, some other, another verse here from Job, Job chapter 8 and verse 4. Dorothy? Verse 4. <clears throat> if your children sinned against him, he allowed them to suffer the consequences of their sinfulness. Yeah, that, that's explains it a lot. <clears throat> okay, did you read did you read off the screen the names of God version? Uh, I did. 
Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so King okay. James says, if thy children have sinned against him and he have cast them away for their transgression, cast them away. This names of God version actually does a good job in translating that verse. He allowed them to suffer the consequences. Okay. And another good version is the God's word translation. It says, if your children sinned against him, he allowed them to suffer the consequences of their sinfulness. Uh, that's the same as the verse above. I must have missed something there. Okay, anyway, that whichever version that is, uh, is a good translation of that. Okay, so let's go to Jeremiah 29, 17. Uh, Fabian. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them like vile things that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Okay, I didn't put in which uh, send upon them would be one of those two words. I'm not sure which one. I should have put that in there. <clears throat> but here it is, the same passage from the new revised standard version um i guess i can read that off the screen there thus says the lord of hosts i'm going to let loose on them sword famine and pestilence etc so it says let loose on them instead of send upon them so it's releasing something that it's the sword of an enemy if you read in context it's not god run them through with a sword Okay, so I think we're seeing lots of examples here of uh, send or sent coming from uh, words that really mean to, to deliver up, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, Jeremiah 15, uh, uh, Gary. <clears throat> she languishes who has born seven. She has breathed her last. Her son has gone down while it was yet day. She has been ashamed and confounded, and the remnant of them I will deliver to the sword before their enemies, says the Lord. Okay, so delivering to the sword and it's the sword of their enemies. Um, Jeremiah 18, 21. Uh, Megan. I'm sorry. <laughs> Therefore, deliver up their children to the famine and pour out their blood by the force of the soul, and let their wives be, be bereaved of their children and be widows, and let their men be put to death. Let their young men be slain by the sword in the battle. Okay, so deliver up those from the word Nathan. And notice I've highlighted uh, three times it says let, let or allow these things to happen to them. Not that God is doing it to them, but his allowing it. That's the meaning of let. The... Yep. Okay, and uh, Jeremiah 25, 31. Michael. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord <laughs> hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Give them that are wicked to the sword. Yeah. And, it's, and so who is he giving to the, to the sword? It's the wicked. And he says before that, he will plead with all flesh. That would include the wicked. So basically, we could say he will please. So it's like, please, please, you know, please, can you change your ways? And if they don't, he gives them up to the results of their choices. Um, basically, he's reluctantly saying, have it your way. <clears throat> okay, uh, Micah 6, 14. Uh, Nora, sorry, I shouldn't mention that. Do you have that, Nora? Yeah. Yeah, 6 to 14. Thou, thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. <clears throat> and the casting down shall be in the midst 
midst of thee, and thou shalt take hold, but shall not deliver. And that which thou deliverest will I give up to the rest, up to the sword. Okay, give up to the sword, not slave with the sword. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ezra 9, 7. Paul, do you have that? <clears throat> Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty, and for our iniquities, we are kings. And our priests have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation, as it is this day. Okay, so they're delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands, into the sword, and captivity, etc. Um, Ezekiel 32.20, uh, the axle again. Um, they shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. <clears throat> she is delivered to the sword. Draw her and all her multitudes. Okay, good. So many examples of the use of those words. Um, to some degree, the, being worded this way is an example of God taking responsibility <clears throat> to a degree. He doesn't do these things personally, but he was allowing them. And so it's expressed as though he was taking responsibility for them. And maybe it was Paul mentioned, this kind of fits in with the cultural mindset of the time. And, you know, everything was attributed to the gods. They were very superstitious people talking about, you know, the Canaanites and all the nations even around Israel, very superstitious. They had many gods and they attributed everything that happened to the gods and they always were trying to please the gods and avoid being on their bad side, etc. And it's interesting. <clears throat> Satan is mentioned very little in the Old Testament, especially early on. And you know, I think God was reluctant to have them mentioned too often because to them, Satan would just be another God. And they would be offering, um, you know, tributes and sacrifices to Satan. In a sense, they were doing it to the other gods, but um, thus to not having it, have them do it too directly. Um, I'd like to read this again it's from Troy Edwards, who wrote those books on, on the word sent. Our Western minds have trouble with some of the ways that the ancient Near Eastern cultures from which our Bible is derived spoke. They held the ruling deity, so that's whatever gods in the area, they held them responsible for all that happened under his reign, regardless of whether or not he had anything to do with it. The Israelites adopted the same pattern of speaking and thinking, it would be, and God used their cultural idioms to have his word recorded. Thankfully, he provided us Westerners with sufficient methods for interpreting the language. Okay, so we've got methods for interpreting. We also have the tools, such as um, concordances and uh, you know, strongs, numbers and things, and computers. And it makes it a lot easier to look up the original words and compare it across different verses and really understand the correct meaning. Another principle that comes in here is God is often said to do what he merely allows or permits. And I've got the link there. You can look at it if you're more interested to a, a page on our website uh, talking about God taking the blame. Okay, his, his, it's written as though he's done many things that he hasn't done, but it corresponds with the thinking of people at that time. A good example of this here is regarding um, King David numbering Israel. Let's read uh, Dorothy. If you could read 2 Samuel 24, 1 and 2, please. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which was with them, go now 
through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. But didn't God allow, didn't God command that to be? That's what it says there, isn't it? He, God, moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Okay, now. Yeah. Okay, Gary. Uh, note there the words. The Lord moved David to number. No, as David heard it, he thought he was listening to the voice of God, but whose voice was it? Oh, okay. You see that? Um, we Sometimes, will... like in those Old Testament stories, Moses thought that God told him to go destroy the Midianites, but who was it that told him? That's Satan, not... just like here. Yeah, How about that's... An, that's a good example. Say, so we can apply this. We have to be careful about the thoughts that are going through our minds and really pray, because if we don't, we might think we're listening to God like David did, but it might be the enemy. Yeah. But it says he moved David against them. He moved. But in the next verse, it says it was Satan that moved him. So how do you reconcile it? Well, the only way you can reconcile that is David thought it was God's voice telling him that, but it was actually Satan's voice. Okay, let's, let's read the next passage, and that will help to clear it up, I think. That's uh, Fabian, please. First Chronicles 21, 1 to 3. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered the Lord, the Lord. Uh, Fabian, you're muted. I am, I'm muted. You were. Oh, yes. As I said, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, the Lord make his people an hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then doth my Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Okay, what's the difference between 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles? Uh, Satan and... Uh, oh. It says Satan and Chronicles, like it names him, but in uh, the other one, the other one, the Lord was just angry with Israel. Yeah, well, that, that's one difference. Um, the Lord uh, told him in one case and Satan in the other case. What's another difference between those two chapters? <clears throat> Just talking about between the two chapters now, not necessarily this incident even. I, I don't know how much. <clears throat> oh, okay, go ahead, Fabian. <clears throat> yes, it's um in, in second in second Samuel, it shows it gives you the idea that it's God is the one who's who given David permission. <clears throat> to number Israel, or who causes David to number Israel. But in First Chronicles, it, it shows you that it's Satan is the one who provokes David to number Israel. Okay, Paul? So I think, I think what it's saying there is David thought it was God, but it was not God. And so actually here, uh, 
That's I mean, it doesn't say that God actually moved it, but if you put the two together, it, it's saying that, I mean, it says he moved David. Or if this is something that's going on in David's mind. There's thoughts, there's impressions, there's angst, there's, uh, there's, there's a uh, constraining power that's pushing him to do this. And David thinks what? That it's God. It says he moved, the Lord moved. But was it? No, David thought it was, but it was actually who? Chronicles, Satan. Okay, uh, Paul? That's, that's not what it says, though, Gary. But also, then it would be a contradiction. There's a contradiction it, between the Lord and Satan. Yeah, the, the anger of the Lord, and then he says he. So we're still thinking it refers to the Lord. Yes, but the point I'm is that it contradicts First Chronicles. So as Gary has mentioned, you have to resolve that contradiction. And I have an answer too, but Paul, you had your hand up. Yeah, as you read in First Chronicles, in that verse, Joab is questioning this. And he says there towards the bottom, why then doth my Lord require this thing? So he knew it was, uh, it wasn't right. Yeah, even if, if Joab even knew, then surely King David knew. But here's here's one difference that's not really obvious. The difference between 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles is, and I forget how much, but several hundred years, possibly. Okay? So 2 Samuel was written, I, I'm pretty sure, by Samuel. 1 Chronicles was written by, most people figure it was Ezra, okay, after the Babylonian exile. And this is kind of chronicling what happened during the time of Samuel and the, the early kings. In the time of um, when 2 Samuel was written, as I mentioned before, Satan had not been mentioned very much up to that point. Okay, God was reluctant to even bring Satan to the surface. But by the time of Ezra, hundreds of years later, it had become more obvious that Satan was involved in these things. And so it was mentioned by name. And, you know, when we read in one case, uh, God moved David to number Israel and the other Satan did it. Just the fact that Chronicles is written later when there's more evidence on the table, we can say, makes it seem more like the correct answer. Also, right at the beginning, we listed all the reasons why God should not be understood to do these things, to send disaster and trouble. Um, you know, as we mentioned, Joab even said, um, why, would, why would you do this thing? Why would you be a cause of trespass to Israel? Um, someone, I don't know if it was Gary, someone mentioned the word permission. I think it was Gary. That's interesting, too, because I think of the example of <clears throat> Hosea. Um, if you read in Hosea, he was told to go take a wife of harlotry and of course that sounds totally contrary to what you know god wants a man to have an honorable wife and everything but it's it's conceivable that hosea was attracted to this woman in spite of her being a harlot and wanted her and so what god said to hosea was not a command so much as permission okay you want her go take her for your wife like israel wanting a king God told them, no, you don't want a king. It'll just be trouble. Oh, we want a king. Okay, go have a king. There's a number of places where God <clears throat> gave permission for Israel, for his people or someone to do what was not the best. He, again, is big on free will. Okay. Uh, David thought that it was God. We've got several possibilities to interpret this. Um, Gary, go ahead. Uh, on your comment on Hosea there, I think that we get back into the mirror principle where God is merely mirroring back to Hosea what is in Hosea's heart. And what is in Hera, uh, his heart is not the perfect will of God to go out and marry somebody, whether you're a man or a woman, somebody who is a harlot, male or female. And so I think God is making manifest, you know, the, the, the corruption of his own heart, not to condemn him, but in order to turn him around and to change him. And that's the pattern 
uh, as far as God and redeeming us, we have to know what our problem is, then confess it, and then uh, depend on the Lord to make the change in our cooperation with him. So I think he was mirroring back what was in Hosea's heart, not telling him to go sin. No, go ahead. I mean, it's so God was not saying go out and marry a harlot, whether you're a man or a woman, don't, don't do that. He was mirroring back to him again, his, you know, the corruption of his heart in order to change him by helping him know what was there. Okay, good. Yeah, another good thought. This mirroring principle is, we're going to see that's really important as we go forward, I think. Um, there's other examples. Um, telling them to go spy out the land, um, hardening Pharaoh's heart. You know, there's, yes. there's verses that say yes. God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and there's others that say Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Okay? God hardened his heart by mm -hmm. bringing him into a situation where he had to make a decision. And he hardened his heart by choosing yes. to not let Israel go. Okay, let's um, continue on. Let's read Question. Esther, Esther 9. Question. Three. Yes, can you um, explain this um, spine of the land? Um, I mean, I, I, know the, I know where it's taken from, but can you explain how it, how it deals with God permitting such and such to happen. Yeah, okay, I'll just say it. I mean, I, I understand with the heart, you know, Pharaoh's heart. Yeah, um, I'd have to go back and find the verses, but I believe it was, was the people's idea when they came up to Kadesh Barnea to send, um, to send spies to spy out the land. And God, while well, God did not approve okay. of it, because when you think of it, he told them to go in and occupy the land. You know, why should they, or sending spies implies doubt in their heart. We need to check this out and make sure it's a safe place. Okay. Well, you don't need to do that because God okay. has already told you that he will clear the land for you and he will lead you into the land. So it was an expression of doubt of God on their part to do that. And yet he gave them permission to do it. You know, select a, one man from each tribe. I forget exactly how it went and, and go and do it. Um, yeah. Something along those lines anyway. Okay, let's read. Yeah, I've never looked at it that way. Yeah, let's read uh, Esther 9, 13. Yeah. That would be Gary, please. Okay. Then <clears throat> Esther said, if it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to do again tomorrow according to today's decree. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. Well, she was merciful, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, that wasn't too merciful. <laughs> <clears throat> but the, the but, hey, that's good Queen Esther, the, Esther, remember? Yeah, yeah. Good Queen Esther is what we're told in Sabbath school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Full of mercy. Uh, the point here is just that the let it be granted is translated from that word Nathan again. Okay, it's 5414. Okay, let's just finish up this part with asking or asking the question, why is this, all that we've looked at here, the correct understanding of sent or send, when God uses it in many cases, why is that important to understand? Can't God just do what he wants? <clears throat> Why is it important to understand that correctly? That God didn't do some of those things? Because it helps us to understand God's character that God does not use the principles of force or coercion or intimidation. Good. That we have perfect freedom and we must in order to be able to choose to love him. And so it's helping us to understand the kind of God that he is. Is he a, a tyrant, a dictator? Or loving God. Yeah. Okay, does he use force or not? All those things. Uh, Fabian, is your hand up there? No. Okay. Sorry. I wasn't sure if your hand was up or you're just relaxed. Or kind of... No, I'll just relax. Sorry about it. Okay, let's read, uh, Megan, if you could read 2 Corinthians 3.18. I think this really points out why this is important. Mm -hmm. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. 
are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, so if we're beholding in the Old Testament all these stories and understanding them as they read on the surface, could that have an effect on our thinking, our character even, as we deal with other people? Monkey see, monkey do. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think so. Okay, that's the end of that. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I'm going to go okay. on to another topic in a minute, but Paul, go ahead. I was just going to point out that that word glass is also mirror in right. some translations. Yeah. <laughs> Again, that gets into the mirror principle, which we will get to at some point. Mm -hmm. Let's look at another topic, um, which relates very much to this. This is a short one we can fit in here about what's referred to as God's strange act. Okay, this is a new separate study now. Um, just give me a sec here. Oops. Uh, my uh, spreadsheet just messed up there. Okay, Michael, if you could read Isaiah 28, 21. Okay. The Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Okay, so we've already looked at the word sent quite a bit, and we concluded that a lot of those passages are kind of strange in that him doing those things would seem to contradict our understanding of his character. Um, this one verse um, referring to God's strange act is often used in regard to the final destruction of the wicked at the end. You know, would God actually burn up his enemies in the final judgment? You know, to me, that seems contradictory. So people will say, well, yeah, it does, but it's his strange act. Like, we can't fully understand it. So we hear of God's strange act, and I would say it would be very strange for him to do that. So I did a quick search on Google for God's strange act, that phrase. And actually, I came up with an example from the Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement. Michael, you're familiar with them. And on there, they say the three major events, three major final events will affect, affect, affect the wicked, um, the plagues, the millennium, and the final judgment. And then it says these events fulfill God's strange act, an act which appears contradictory to his love and mercy. For the safeguard of the whole universe, God acts wisely and justly in the destruction of sin and sinners. Okay, so that's from uh, Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement. So that reflects most people's thinking on God's strange act. And the basic idea is you've been warned, God doesn't like to have to do it, but for the good of the universe and to put sinners out of their misery, God will finally destroy them in the end. That's the thinking. Why would that be a problem? It's totally against the character of love, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Totally, totally against mercy. Yeah. It makes uh, it makes God uh, an executioner. He raises people after the uh, in the second resurrection only to execute them. I mean, that's no different than the uh, governments and systems of the world as far as it goes to law and the way they they govern. Yeah. Okay. And one thought is that it, um, it involves God using death as the final solution. You know, uh, Fabian. Yes. Um, when we read in um, Hosea 11, 8, 
Photo Hosea 11.8, and we will see something here, where it says, how shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as a boy? My heart is turned within me. My repentance are kindled together. So when we compare this to God's strange act, God's strange act is the giving up of the wicked to their own devising, to their own destruction. Their own that in itself is a strange act to God. When God gives the wicked up, that in itself is, is very painful to God. So, That in itself, yeah, because you have to allow them to report this. So, but that in itself is, a, is, is very painful to God. So that's a strange, that is strange to him. Strange in the, in the sense that it's, it, it's, it's painful. It's hard. Mm -hmm. So even, even when this, oof, this comes to an end, that whole destruction will be painful to God yeah. till the end. Okay, good. That Hosea 11, it certainly does fit in there. Um, yeah. It goes along with our understanding of scent as well. What happens in the end mm -hmm. is not that God destroys people in the final judgment. It's that he gives them up mm -hmm. to the final consequence mm -hmm. of the choices they have made. Okay? Um, mm -hmm. Just gonna, I was just going to share that when I did this Google search um, on the first page of results in Google, I found this site here. <clears throat> and that's, I was happy to see that because that's my other website, uh, JesusResurrection.info. And I have a page there, Fire from Heaven, God's Strange Act or Our Misunderstanding. So on that page, you can find uh, more about God's Strange Act there. <clears throat> and right below that, was another uh, another mention by Google of uh, God's strange act by Adrian Evans. So he has a book on that as well, God's strange act, a little booklet. Okay, so with this verse. Um, Why are people? Ray? Yes, uh, Paul. I just wanted to point out that in that verse, Isaiah twenty eight twenty one, um, there's two Strong's numbers um, for that word "strange." So I, I haven't looked them up yet, but uh, one's one's twenty one fourteen. And the other one's 52.37. For the word strange. Oh, I see. The, the two different uses have two different words. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So if you want to do further research on this, the first one is... Zur something, which is uh, to be a, to be strange, to be a stranger. And the second one is no Cree, foreigner, alien. Yeah, they sound like they're pretty similar words, pretty similar meanings. Okay, but here's the key to, to all this. Um, God's strange work is quoted from Isaiah 28, 21, but in that verse, his strange work is not to destroy or kill people at all, okay? We need to look at where it's quoting from, as in or similar to Mount Perizim and the Valley of Gibeon. Um, just before we go there, I'll read this uh, sentence. 
from the book God's Strange Act by Adrian. It says, one way that people have tried to resolve the tension between a loving and a vengeful God is to suggest that God is typically loving in nature, but in very extreme circumstances, such as in the final judgment, he will change for a brief moment in order to restore harm harmony to the universe. This is referred to as his strange work. Okay, so people just kind of suggest that in the end, God will do what he has to do or whatever. But let's look at as Mount Perizim. Um, okay, let's read uh, 2 Samuel 5, 17 to 20. Uh, Nora, do you have that? Yeah. <clears throat> Seventeen. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Repadam, or whatever it is. And David in inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to Philistine? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord and unto David, um, go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to uh, the Bala Padiam or whatever, and David uh, smote them there and said, I am, and said, the Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as to the uh, breadth of waters. Therefore, he called the name of the place uh, Bella. Can't say the word. Okay, that's fine. Doesn't matter. Thank you. So, in what Isaiah, is it? it's Bella something or other. Yeah. In Isaiah 28 21, it refers to God's strange act as in Mount Perizim. What did God do in Mount Perizim? He simply allowed David to uh, do carry out the destruction of that that people. Right. It says he didn't uh, prevent. He didn't prevent it. Right. He didn't prevent it. It says he delivered the Philistines into his hand. So, you know, God is protecting everyone as much as He can. When the Philistines, you know, it talks about the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full and. Um, you know, all those nations had turned totally away from God. God allowed them to fall, you know, under David. And David smote them there. It's David and his army that did the killing, not God. So to take Isaiah 28, 21, God's strange act, and say that is an example of or a, a way to express God's killing of his enemies in the end is not right. What he did was to remove protection or allow them, he delivered them is what it says. Paul? Um, yeah, he just honored David's free will. David had it in his own heart to do this. And so God just allowed it to happen. Probably also because the Philistines were an evil people and they had turned away from God long ago. So he just... Like you say, he removed his protection. Yeah. <clears throat> so I've 
written a little paragraph on here, Baal Perizim has the meaning of Baal, or Lord, of breakings forth. What happened there was that God delivered the Philistines into the hand of David and his army. While God did nothing to protect the Philistines, he did not personally fight against them. He simply, over, he simply withdrew his protective care from them. We should not think that a God of love only cared about the nation of Israel. He cares about the others as well. So let's, in Isaiah 28, 21, it also refers to the Valley of Gibeon. You know, God's strange act is like as, he, as what he did in the Valley of Gibeon. So in the Valley of Gibeon, let's read that, um, that event there. Gibeon made peace. Gibeon was a nation that made peace with Israel and for doing so, it was threatened by other nations, and they asked Joshua to come and save them. And the Lord reassured Joshua by saying in Joshua 10, 8, uh, Paul, do you have that? Yep. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Okay. So... Again, God was not destroying the Gibeonites. What he did, he said, I have delivered them into thine hand. Okay? So he was giving them over to, to Joshua to deal with. Again, delivered us from that word, Nathan, that we looked at. Okay, and then go to verse 10. Um, Axel, do you have that? Yes, I do. Um... And the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them all along the way that goeth up to Beth, Beth Horon and smote them to, to Azek, Azekah <clears throat> and unto Mekedah. Oh. Okay. So, the wording gets a little bit awkward here. Um, we know that it was, if you read the whole context, it was Joshua and his army that did the slaying. God allowed it. And it's an interesting word here, discomfited, which I think we've looked at in the past. And I think it's another word that we should look into a bit more and add to the glossary. Um, I think the discomforting, in a lot of cases, is, is linked with confusion and um, challenging their consciences, maybe, um, that kind of thing. <clears throat> okay, let's read then verse 11. Uh, Dorothy, do you have that? And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel <laughs> and were in the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones and they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Okay, so that, that verse could be a real challenge, and it is, and I'm not going to deal with it today. Um, Actually, Adrian had uh, a study on this, the hailstones, recently, and uh, we'll need to look at that as its own incident, I think. But verse 12, I think, helps as well. Um, Fabian, do you have that? Joshua 10, 1 to 2, or 12? 12. Oh, 12, sorry, sorry. Then speak Joshua to the Lord, in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Okay, so again, the word, uh, or the, the words delivered up, they come from the Hebrew word Nathan there. Okay. So God didn't personally destroy them. He delivered them up to the children of Israel. Okay. And there's quite a significant event there. It says the moon, um, 
yeah, the moon and the sun stood still. So it was like the earth stopped, stopped uh, rotating there for a bit. Mm. Another issue. Yeah, another issue. Um, you know, Christ called Satan a murderer from the beginning in John 8, 44. The question is, does God, as we think about the final judgment of some of these questions and this strange act, does God have the final word by becoming the murderer in the end? Um, let's read John 5, 29. Trouble question. Trouble question. Ready? Ready? Yeah, go ahead. And come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation, condemnation. <clears throat> okay, and uh, John 10, 10. Megan, do you have that? Yes, please. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Mm -hmm. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Okay. So the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and this is used or applied to Satan. Um, this is certainly not things that, that God does, okay? God does not take on the attributes of Satan. And I think this verse is very significant as well here. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Michael, you have that? Yep. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, so why would God want to destroy death if... if uh, there are people who think that he's the one in charge of it all. It just doesn't compute, does it? No, it doesn't make sense. Very true. Um, Very true. You know, God uses his enemy, death, as the final solution. It just does not make sense. All right. So, no, no. <laughs> hopefully, in all this, we've come to a little more understanding, at least that things need to be understood correctly. Um, we need to go back. In this case of uh, God's strange act, we need to look at that more carefully. It's obviously jumping to conclusions to say that his strange act refers to his killing of his enemies in the end, in the final judgment, because that's not what happened in Terrorism or Gibeon. Okay? People use verses like this without doing their homework, basically, without looking into it. So we do need to look carefully. Uh, Michael, go ahead. Um, most of us have come through or uh, with the Seventh-day Adventist uh, background, uh, and we certainly know that they what they think about God's strange act. But my question is, have are we are you aware or anyone aware of other denominations that tend to look at Isaiah 28, 21 in, in similar fashion, or is this something sort of strangely uh, Adventist? No. No? No. A lot of the churches that I visited, they all believe the same thing. Yeah. When, I, uh, when I Googled that, it seemed to me that there was other, a lot of other websites that would be from other denominations. I didn't look at them carefully. I just I picked this one out. I didn't really have time to go further. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other thoughts? Or Hopefully that was helpful. It was. Always helpful. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, Fabian. Yes, um, Ray. You, you have mentioned the word um, discomfited. And you said that, um, you know, confusion could be one of the meanings. And my mind went on to the, the isn't that it? The Tower of Babel. Now the Bible said God is not a God of confusion. 
so how we how do we um, explain the Tower of Babel? Hmm. That's a good question. That is heavy. Because he confused their languages there, right? Yeah. It may be Fabian, you should look into that for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we, we laugh, we laugh, but, you know, we shouldn't yeah. become dependent on other people to answer all our spiritual questions. You know, we need to get in there and, and understand. Yeah, yeah. It's just some, yeah. I mean, it's just something to look into. Question. Are you volunteering? It seems like, yeah, those, those places, no, I'm not, but I got a statement. The, a lot of times that uh, we read those references, God sent fear into their hearts. Not necessarily that he did that, but when God shows up, there is a natural human reaction to that, and there is fear, same way with the Tower of Babel. When God shows up, it people are vexed uh, because of their sinfulness. There's so much difference in character between purity and corruption that it scares people. It's not that God put the fear there. It's just that it's a natural outflow of their own corruption and their selfishness. Okay, good. Yeah, I think there's really something to this that, you know, God does not, he does not want us to have fear. He says, fear not many, many times in scripture. But because of our sinful nature and our record and our thoughts in our head, maybe whatever, we tend to fear when we're confronted with divinity or, or challenges from that direction. Um, yeah, that's yeah. all interesting. Another good topic. We'll never run those guys, those, those guys at Babel were so scared and confused, they can't even talk straight to each other. Okay. They were just <laughs> babbling. Yeah. Yeah. Probably is that. I, I don't think um, the, the those languages came about in one day. I think I think it took a period of time. As time goes by, languages and evolve, and you know, I think that was just the nature of sin. Could Taking be. it, yeah, having its way, you know. Yeah. That's just how I see it. Yeah, it would be interesting to know. So you can look into it for us. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> be careful what questions you bring up. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. Yeah, that's true. I think we will. Yes, thank, uh, you. Welcome. thank you. Thank you. We will stop Thanks, there. Let Chris. me. Uh,